Our next guest is a man that I will let introduce himself. But he is here to tell us about a billion consumers you need to court. Without much ado, I will introduce Emmanuel Onyeje, the country manager for Microsoft Nigeria. Good afternoon, everybody. Great. Hope you guys enjoying yourself. You are? Fantastic. I think the talks have been absolutely amazing. Don't you think so, huh? Absolutely. TED is just great. TED's about T, technology. Well, I'm from technology company. That'd be easy for me. E, entertainment. Well, hopefully I can entertain you with my presentation. D for design. Well, you can tell I'm not a passion designer, but hopefully you will love the design of my slides. So, a very popular man says the world is getting better, but it's not getting better fast enough, and it's not getting better for everyone. Who said that? Bill Gates, the non-executive chairman of Microsoft. And funny enough, when Femi introduced me, he's actually the very first person who, thank you, Femi, for not introducing me as the Bill Gates of Nigeria. Because every single time I come and say to speak, that's introduced me. Oh, please welcome the Bill Gates of Nigeria. I'm like, I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not Bill Gates. When it happened the third time, I asked at myself, really, who am I? Who really am I? Oh, by the way, um, I photoshopped that thing. I'm a techie guy, so make myself look less handsome, you know. But anyway, who am I? Really, why are people calling me Bill Gates all the time? And you know what? I decided to do some research, and voila, there were similarities, funny enough. Funny enough, Bill Gates started programming at the age of 13. Very young kid, that's when he started. I kid you not, I first fell in love with computers, and I started programming at the age of 13. A bit older there, but that is me. Okay? Then, on the 1st of July, 2007, Bill Gates changed the role in Microsoft. He now became the non-executive chairman, no more data responsibilities, and he focused on his um, foundation, doing great work in education and health. On July 1st, 2007, I changed role in Microsoft too, moving from running services to doing something for Francophone Africa, running the whole region. Great experience, I was based in Senegal. There was one more thing. Forbes says that Bill Gates is worth an amazing and whopping $55 billion. This is the third fact that makes me and Bill Gates ideal on the same thing. I checked my bank account on the way here, and you won't believe it. You will not believe this. Me too. I am worth a whole 55,000 naira. So 55, $55 naira is the same thing. You know, one of the same thing. But the reason why I brought it up, really, is really my story of my surgery with Microsoft when I actually went to Senegal. And in Senegal, I realized something that it's a great country, a beautiful country. It used to be dependent on the French and, the, and the Belgium for trade. It was now more dependent in Africa. It focused inwards. It's one of its biggest traded partners. It's actually us here in Nigeria. They speak French, we speak English. But a lot of trade happened there. One of the very first routes outside of Lagos for, the, for our regional carriers was Dakar because Africans are now looking inwards because they can no longer rely on the third world. And Africa has great potential, absolutely great potential, amazing potential. Do you know how big Africa is? This map is showing how big Africa is. It's the same size as continental USA, India, China, Western Europe, Japan, all combined as a landmass. We have land, we have minerals, we have people. That's the potential we actually have. But how do people view, how do people really view Africa? Every time you go online or you watch a movie or Western news, this is one of the pictures you see. And you know what? I love it. We have great, beautiful landscape. Absolutely beautiful landscape. Nothing at all. That we should, we should, we're very proud of it completely. They also show us our native culture. When it comes to diversity, no other continent is as diverse as we are. We should embrace it imbibe it, and love it, and promote it. But they also do show this part of Africa. That yes, there are some people who have, and lots more who don't have. And it's real. I want to solve that problem of poverty. The population of Africa is just over a billion people. That's a lot of people on this continent. 
over a billion. That's a massive market opportunity for anybody. Question is, how do you view those billion people? Do you view them as people begging for support all the time? Do you? Is that your view of the African continent? Traditionally, people are looking for markets that are ripe and ready to be taken. That yes, I want people already affluent, have disposable income. That's the basis of judging the market. But what's interesting about that? That particular market is only 14% of the global population. Why is everyone struggling for that 14%? The margins come thinner. People are asking for different services. Why are you leaving 86% on the table? Why? And this talk is talking about the other 86% that do require services, can have services, and can make you a proper business. Africa has a new middle class that's been growing rapidly. Six of the top 10 fastest growing economies are all African countries. A lot of them also in West Africa, including places like Ghana and Nigeria. Fastest growing economies for the past decade or so, or so have been in this continent. And this middle class that's growing is massive. In actual fact, it's the same size as India. You've heard of BRIC? Brazil, Russia, India, China. Actually, they add South Africa as BRICS, right? The middle class on this continent is big, or it's bigger than that of India. That's the first thing you should think about. The question is, how do you tap into that middle class? What services do you need to offer? See, for us, huh, Africa has this notion that we're so poor, you need to be donating. Donation is not sustainable. It's not a sustainable model at all, in any form or fashion. As they say, man can live by bread alone. Africa will not be sustained by donations alone. We need a more sustainable model. And that model is really about jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs create wealth. And you know what? Who creates jobs? Businesses. Small businesses, large businesses. But globally, the people who create the most jobs are the small businesses. What's Africa about? about small businesses. So who's going to create jobs for us? It's entrepreneurs. Any of these people here could definitely be great entrepreneurs moving forward. We've seen some on stage already today, some great entrepreneurs. From the animation people, from Deal Day, those ones who create jobs. We don't need to go outside to create wealth in Africa. We just need to create jobs and opportunities. But there are barriers, of course. There definitely are barriers. But you know, what other better place for an entrepreneur than in a market where there's a billion people waiting for service? As a entrepreneur, you go where there's money, where there's potential to invest. That's what the billion people in Africa are asking you. Hey, we want service. Hey, we want things to get done. If you remember, Sim from Deal Day said something about retail, no retail in Nigeria. I don't know, if you ever fly outside this country, ever, to Europe or US or Asia, and you look for the Lagos flights, the flights that come back into Lagos, that's where all the excess luggage is. Oh, why? Because there ain't no retail here. Yet we love buying abroad. Weird, eh? When we should be here doing things here for the billion people asking for service here. But of course, to do that, you need disruptive innovation. You can't take, cut and paste what happened in Europe and America and expect it to work here. Absolutely not. Disruptive innovation is really important. I want to give you an example of disruptive innovation. We all know that in Africa, it's really more of a mobile first ecosystem. Mobile phones are really just everywhere. But do you know how many they are? Someone told you earlier on about 700 million. It's actually a bit more than that. People believe in more about 800 million, and by, 20, by 2015, about 850 million mobile phones. That's nearly every individual with a mobile phone. That's amazing. But to get really disruptive with that technology, I need access. I need to be able to connect and commerce and do things. And you know, as I said, infrastructure is really weak here. Really, really weak. Let me show you how weak it actually is. You know, see where Nigeria is? It's number 10 in Africa. See number one? Ghana. What's interesting about this particular list, that Ghana is the only country that has broadband faster than the global average. No one else has. No other African country. Which shows that infrastructure is really dilapidated. No one where it needs to be. And how can you disrupt a 
and innovate around there. One example, very simple example, is something they call white space. I know you guys know what technology get, people. Well, think about this. You know NTA. Everyone knows NTA, right? Every state had an NTA station. And we used to have one big tower, one massive tower that would broadcast to the whole town or the whole place. And of course, you guys know MTN, Glow, Airtel, and everyone. How many towers do they have? You have thousands of tire, towers all over the place. If you can find a way to use television to broadcast internet, you solve your cost problems. One tower to blanket everywhere. You want to put a thousand towers, you most likely cover the whole of Africa. And you know what? This technology exists. Who's going to disrupt and implement it here? Who? When? Why haven't you started? That's disruption. That's what it requires to leapfrog people, to decide to take challenges on and find innovative ways of conquering them. Now, what am I asking entrepreneurs and investors to do? Can you, do you guys know which one is the entrepreneur and which one is the investor? Or which one thinks he's the richest person in his community? Which I means very difficult to tell, huh? But both of them feel that they're great investors and entrepreneurs and wealthy in their own community. But whether you're an investor or an entrepreneur, what am I asking you to do? The first thing I'm asking you to do is think about leveraging the local talent because it exists. There is talent here. We have them. We've seen them. We saw them again today. Animating, setting up businesses, singing, playing instruments. We have them in many fields of sphere. They might not have all the skills you require. Don't wait for the occasional system to fix it. Invest in giving the right skills. Write the whole broad set of skills, the business skills, technical skills, because that's what it takes. If you're waiting for ready-made people, well, let's wait on the government that's not making ready-made people. Entrepreneurs, they innovate. So they'll find innovative ways to get talent to their teams. At the same time, huh, we need to make sure we're looking at local solutions, solutions that are for Africa, by Africans. Because we understand what people require. We understand the pricing structure that people like. We can remove all the barriers of importation. But we must be pushing local solutions. Because it's then entrepreneurs will have the conviction to invest more. It's then we'll create more jobs. It's then we'll create more wealth in Africa. If we are fostering and thinking of local solutions using local talent, investing in them. So, I have talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. I usually even talk, talk, talk. I have to talk about all sorts of things right now, okay? And you know, they say that you know, when you talk, maybe you learn some things. If you understood half things like that, maybe you've got some knowledge. What's interesting is that people say that knowledge is power. That with knowledge are how you have power. Well, does anyone know anyone called John Antonios? Nor do I. I have actually no idea who he is. But he had this brilliant quote I saw on the internet where he says, knowledge is not power. Knowledge plus action is power. We can do something with it. What you have, what you're going to do about it? Because you know, a billion people are waiting for an answer. There's a very, I think, unfortunately you can't see it, but it's a very popular proverb in Africa. It says the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. 20 years ago. The best time to plant a tree. The second best time is now. Now. Not tomorrow. Knowledge plus action. Knowledge plus action is power. So, as I was introduced, my talk is about, think about this. The billion people you see in Africa, do you think they're begging for support? Or do you think that there are a billion customers that you should go out and court. Thank you.